Hey, what's up, guys? This is Hart with Swag, and you're about to watch the first episode of Weed Jobs. On today's episode, I interview Kevin Cordelieu, a bud tender with Herbology Philadelphia. Kevin gives us some great insight on how anyone looking to get into this industry can do it with a little hard work. If you like what you see on today's episode, like, comment, and subscribe, and don't forget to follow your boy on social media. So without further ado, here's the first episode of Weed Jobs. Hey, uh, thank you guys for joining us today at Swag Media. I'm joined today with Kevin Cordelieu. Uh, he is a current, uh, he's in the cannabis industry in uh, Philadelphia and the medicinal industry. And we're just going to go a little bit into his background and we got him started in the industry and uh, the day-to-day -day of his job duties uh, for anyone that's interested in, in joining the industry and learning more about it. Uh, so Kevin, how you doing today, man? Doing very well, man. I can't complain. How about, your, how about yourself? I'm doing great, man. It's, it's always sunny in Philly. Even oh, yeah, always. <laughs> yeah. Even when it rains, it's sunny. There we go. Well, thank you for joining us today and, and sharing your story. Uh, can you Absolutely. tell us a little bit about yourself, like where you're from, where you grew up? Uh, well, I grew up uh, in South New Jersey, and um, it was a great town, but after, like, as you get older, um, you know, things kind of uh, get old after a while, and it was a very... It wasn't a very artistic scene. It was kind of just, uh, you know, a place where people live when they're done doing things and stuff. But uh, yeah, I've, I've always wanted to pursue uh, the career I have now. And um, but I recently I moved to Philly a couple of years ago and uh, to pursue this career now. But yeah, it's bas basically yeah, I grew up is around like Bridgeton, New Jersey. Okay, cool, man. Shout out to South Jersey. I grew up in Sicklerville. Oh, so, I know exactly what you're talking about. I love my hometown, but, uh, you know, I had to spread the wings a little bit. Absolutely. Cool, man. And so, like, you grew up in New Jersey. What was your experience with cannabis before you found out that there was a career in it? Um, well, I was always just really interested in what it can do for us, what, how it interacts with the human body and, like, the miraculous healing process that it goes through to uh, give people relief from, you know, terrible, terrible ailments. That's really what got me interested in it. I mean, obviously everybody first hears, Oh, it's a, it's a plant that can get you high and stuff. And uh, yeah, that's great and all, but it's, it's so much more than just that, you know, and the, just that whole intimacy of the plant alone is really what got me interested. Okay. Yeah. So you are really more interested in the medicinal effects and benefits of it. Yeah, I mean, it's just like, on the one hand, it can make you feel amazing. And it can also heal your body, which is just absolutely mind blowing. That's cool. And how did you how did you find out about that? Because, you know, growing up, you know, I, I guess I kind of heard wise tales about it. But primarily, people were just more interested in it as a, a party drug. Or well, something to, like relax. Well, yeah, even before I started experimenting, uh, I was always just kind of interested in why it was so demonized and stuff like that. It was just like, I've never heard of anybody dying or getting addicted. And uh, afterwards, I just kind of decided to look more into that of why that doesn't happen with us. And since then, it just you, you find rabbit hole after rabbit hole of like the cannabis plant, learning what terpenes are, how they affect your body. And uh basically yeah just uh going deeper and deeper into the hole with finding out stuff on the internet with just like researching watching a bunch of documentaries and you know it, it, and it just made me realize that cannabis is much more than just a simple plant oh that's awesome so how how were people kind of i guess using it or accessing it around you or do you have anybody who's life was affected by the prohibition or not being able to get access to it? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I, uh, part of the reason why I was, you know, so, uh, so hell bent on just getting to like the medicinal parts of this plant was because, yeah, I've had uh, family members, you know, pass away from, uh, certain diseases and stuff that could have been, um, cured, if not just put off longer by cannabis and, 
every day when I go into work, I'm wondering if I'm going to be saving somebody else's uh, parent or, you know, sibling or anything like that, you know, and I try to like put my work in to what I would have put my work into uh, towards the people I've lost, you know, and uh, yeah, that definitely goes along with my everyday position and job and in the workplace. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's awesome. So what kind of work were you doing before you, you found the cannabis industry? Uh, dead, dead end, dead end shit, man. Uh, uh, at first uh, I was doing clerical work for a dentist office um, and then I went towards working a factory job for a couple of years. It just like, you know, it's just rinse, wash, repeat assembly line stuff every day. And, you know, every job starts out cool and then it's, it's maddening towards the end. Uh, but besides that, and then I went into sales, uh, right before sales, before I went into the, uh, cannabis industry. And I was also, uh, bartending and, uh, bar backing and stuff like that. So just doing like small odd jobs to make ends meet. Okay. Yeah. You got to do what you got to do. You were, it sounds like you were grinding it out. Oh, I got to. Yeah. Philly is, it's not cheap, <laughs> nor is anywhere, I guess, you know? Yeah. Okay. And uh, so like when I guess they were talking about um, ending the prohibition and legalizing cannabis, were you still in New Jersey or were you already in Philly? Um, yeah, I was already, uh, I was in New Jersey, uh, when things like started kicking off about legalization, you know, it was obviously like still in Jersey, uh, when Colorado was like, Hey, we're doing this thing, you know, we're, we're not taking no for an answer anymore. We are legalizing this. Um, but yeah, I was still in Jersey when everything was like popping off with legalization. Okay. Did you ever travel out there or to anywhere can uh, be legal? Oh yeah. It's, and honestly, this was like what really like sparked it. So uh, me and a bunch of my best friends, uh, we were all working that dead end factory job I told you about. And then one of them was driving back home to California and we were going to go on a road trip. So that's exactly what we did. We, we drove all the way across the country and it was in the midst. Like it was fresh right after Colorado was like, Hey, we're legalizing this thing. So it doesn't even have to be said, but we were like, yeah, we have to go to Colorado. We have to like at least skim there. And we made it to a place called Durango, Colorado. And that's like a very like bottom South, like just like the South as you can go in uh, Colorado. And um, yeah, so we went there and turned out the place we were at was just medical and recreational and the only place we were able to get to was this dis- uh, dispensary that was a me- just a medical dispensary, but we're all skateboarders and there was a skate shop right above there. So it was like, boom, boom, like perfect, perfect world for us. <laughs> you and saw then, the signals. Exactly. And uh, yeah, so it was only medical because so we really couldn't get anything. I mean, um, somebody had like helped us out so we could get some. It was actually like, the owner of the skate shop. And um he, uh, it was just a wonderful experience, like sharing that with him, like him getting that for us and then us hanging out with him. And then we're literally like on the skate shop balcony and just watching patient after patient, just like walk into the dispensary now. And I'm just like thinking to myself like, this is crazy. Like they, they were, these people would have been in jail the other day. And like yeah. now they can finally not feel like criminals anymore and get the medicine they deserve. And I remember like asking to go into the dispensary but in the cannabis industry it's very very strict laws it may seem like the most laid-back thing in the world but it is very strict i mean depending on where you're at pennsylvania especially is very strict okay. but they were like hey, yeah you can come in and take a look around just don't go in where all the flour is and you know they <laughs> let me peek my head in there and i saw this girl in there just like rolling joints and i was like how's the work day going and she's like oh another <laughs> hard day you know and i'm just like Getting paid to roll joints. Exactly. And you know what's funny about that? I heard that uh, Snoop had put out like a job ad for a joint roller or a blunt roller. Oh, yeah. I think uh, Wiz Khalifa did too. Okay. But yeah, after seeing that and just like being so invigorated with the whole experience and like the potential of the future of the industry, that was when I decided I was like, I am going to do this. Like, I'm working in this industry. And it's not for bragging rights or anything like that. It's for 
it's for sticking it to big pharma and being like we are going to give medicine back to the people for the people you know what i mean yeah. But, yeah that's definitely what really like made it happen we went out there and visited colorado when legalization first happened yeah i i know that had to be like so mind-blowing I remember my first time going to uh, somewhere where it was legal. I was in Vancouver for work. I was only scheduled to be there for 24 hours. And I didn't even realize, like, it was just like, yo, you got to go to Vancouver when you get there, you know, do what you got to do. And then you book your flight to leave in the morning. So I had to like pretty much leave that same day, get on the plane. So I'm not really thinking like, oh man, you know, BC, but it comes from British Columbia. It's been legal there for a minute. I was just like, I'm going to Canada. I love Canada. So <laughs> when I got there and I finished my work, I went to go get some food. And uh, the the lady at the restaurant was like, hey, yeah, make sure you like go visit a dispensary while you're here. And I was like, wait, we's legal here? <laughs> that was like, yes, like you're in a place where it's legal. So I was like, man, all right, so I started looking up some shops, and then she comes back with a, a cookie, and she goes, "Oh yeah, you know, uh, we have a, a chef here who who makes uh, dessert and pastries." So I was like, "All right, cool." So I, I gobbled that down, and uh, I went to a dispensary that she recommended, and it was across the street from this this cafe um, where you could go and enjoy cannabis and. I noticed that there was like no parking lot, but I'm like, man, there's a bar right there. You could drive your car to the bar. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't one outside of this like cafe uh, weed shop. So I go in and then there's people just like smoking bongs and smoking joints and um, eating, watching the NBA playoffs. And I'm like, yo, this is incredible. Like, I can't believe that this is possible. And look how sane these people are. There's no one puking outside. There's no fights. No fights. No. <laughs> and uh, I was just blown, completely blown away. And it can just like really open my eyes to the possibilities uh, once this, you know, became a thing in the States. Uh, so like from your experience, like how long was it from you seeing the the – the legalization of cannabis. I guess you were in a, a medical state at the time, Colorado. Mm. So now you actually having a job. Like how, how long the process was? How long was that period? Oh, so you, were, that, you got your inspiration and then you were like, yeah, I, I really want to work in, in the cannabis industry. Got you. I would say that was probably a six year train right there. Um, uh, yeah, a lot of hard work and a lot of studying and a lot of just, you know, hunting for the hunting for the job. <laughs> right. So when did you have plans to travel to a, a legal state or had you already heard rumblings about the industry coming to the East Coast? Um, yeah, I mean, um, I had heard that Pennsylvania was looking towards um, medical legalization. And while we were also me and like eight of my friends were in the process of you know, saying like, we're going to leave the New Jersey chapter behind and we're going to move to Philly and we're going to start some other stuff. And uh, I, yeah, I even lived in Philly for at least like three years uh, before, you know, even getting to now, you know, so it was a long, long road. <laughs> I got you. Now you mentioned that you were doing some studying. Was it to like, like le learn more about the industry or prepare for a certain position? Um, yeah, definitely that. Um, and just, trying to read books on cannabis and trying to just figure out, you know, how to know what you're talking about when it comes to cannabis, you know what I mean? And how to actually like prescribe a certain patient, a strain based off of what uh, needs it'll meet, you know? So studying like that, you know, just watching documentaries and like anything I can do to find more knowledge on cannabis. Okay. Yeah. I guess we can get some of your book recommendations a little later. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, do you know any off the top of your head that you like really liked? There was uh yeah. like it was called like Dr. Green's Bible or something like that, but that was like one of the very first ones I picked up and it was like a really 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 good one. Okay. Yeah, one of the the books that kind of piqued my interest was the uh the book by Jack Harris. Oh, okay. Yeah, that uh 
that was like the little encyclopedia. <laughs> nice. To read back in the day. So, yeah. Yeah. So when you when like what year did you first hear the rumblings that it was that uh, legalization was coming to your state, and like what did you do to like say all right I'm gonna start looking up companies and prepare to get in this thing? Well, I mean to be quite honest the rumblings just like hit out of nowhere because like it happened while I didn't even know it was happening. You know what I mean? Like I uh, had talked to an old friend uh, that went to high school. Uh, his name is Mike. And I was like, uh, I was like, Hey, how's it going, man? What are you doing these days? And he was like, Oh, I work in a medical dispensary. I was like, wait, aren't you like, don't you live here? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, wait, what? When did they do that? It seemed like it just happened out of nowhere. And I had no idea. And then I, it was honestly right there where I was just like, okay, now's the time. Now's the time to pursue this. And so, yeah, it just like the rumblings just kind of just happened out of nowhere. Right. And so, so you hear this, you, you're like, I'm getting into this industry. How many dispensaries were around at the time you started applying? Um, when I first started applying, um, I mean, I applied to one in uh, Jersey because I was like, oh, there's one out there. But it, the, it, the scene was terrible out in New Jersey because there was like three dispensaries all like two to three hours apart from each other and like easily like an hour apart from my house. And so I was, that wasn't going to work out. But then, um, yeah, when I first started applying in Philadelphia, there was a decent amount, way more than I thought. There was at least like six or seven like that right. uh, was that was a decent drive from my house okay and so what was what was the interview process like for you or, or what jobs did you see that were out there um so the the interview process was it's definitely different than um any job i've worked before where um there's there's a lot of loops you uh you you're a lot of hoops you have to jump through um I would say I probably had at least two pers two in person interviews and three over the phone interviews, and the whole hiring process took at least like three months because you know, like I said, especially in Pennsylvania, the industry is very strict, and they are gonna make sure they know everything about you before you know <laughs> before they hire you. You know. Okay. Yeah, that three month hiring process that's a that's intensive. That's a long time too. Yeah, and a lot of people like start to like lose a little hope, but you know, you just got to got to keep fighting, got to keep going and just be be annoying <laughs> and uh do what you got to do to, you know, get your dream. Right. So, what positions were you applying for? Uh, I was applying for a patient uh patient consultant, which is basically, you know, um it's like a bud tender. It's essentially a bud tender. So, you know, and great name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um uh, but yeah, just uh, basically talking to patients, uh, letting them, you know, tell you what they need to tell you and uh, what they're trying to treat with cannabis and you taking the knowledge that you have and picking out certain strains to uh, to give them that strain so it'll help them. But okay. yeah, that, that's what I applied for and that's that's what I am now. So you're kind of like a, a sommelier of, of cannabis? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess you could say that. Okay. So what, how did they determine that you would be good for that position? Um, well, I'm, I had um, some knowledge on uh, terpene profiles and uh, stuff like that. And obviously knowing the uh, difference between the Indica Sativa hybrid, knowing which hybrids that are possible to have and stuff like that, you know, just like honestly knowledgeable cannabis. You can't just like work in this. I tell everybody in the industry, like if you want to get into this industry and you just think you can make it because you like to smoke a lot of weed, it's not going to happen. You know, <laughs> you just like, you got to like love this plant. You got to appreciate it. You got to like do it for the love of the people, love of the culture, you know? Right. So being a weed head is just not, it's not it. It's actually like understanding and having a desire to want to help people out and understand the plant. A hundred percent, Chris. You have to really like, not to sound smug, but know what you're talking about. And uh, you can't just be like, oh, I blaze it every single day, 420. <laughs> like, it's just, that just doesn't work like that. You know, like you gotta, it's, it's a professional job. You know, you can like, it's laid back, but you, 
there has to be professionalism and you, you have to have actual knowledge of, of cannabis. Okay. So I, I noticed you, you, you mentioned some uh, industry terms. Could you tell us a little bit more about terpenes and what that means? Yeah, absolutely. So this is the, every patient should be focusing on this, but terpene profiles are essentially the uh, essential oils and aromas of the cannabis plant. And the terpenes give your uh, high, its character uh, characteristics and medical abilities. So to put it like this, so here's a terpene, it's called linalool, L-I-N-A-L-O-O-L. And that is a terpene that deals with anti-anxiety. And the reason that is, is because linalool is also found in lavender. And you know, when the human brain is exposed to the scent of the taste of lavender, it kind of allows the brain to take a breath. Yeah, so, just chill, relax. Exactly. So yeah. even though it's found in lavender, it's also found in thousands of different cannabis strains. So, uh, so a strain that's high in linalool, uh, which you'll have testing on the back of all your products and stuff of each terpene profile. If it's high in linalool, excellent for anxiety you know, because it's, or the, you know, the lack thereof. Right. Uh, and then you'll have strains like, or uh, terp, uh, terpenes like myrcene. Myrcene is usually what um, dictates a strain to be a indica because myrcene is a very relaxing, sedating uh, indica that also like helps boost your appetite and uh, helps with um, inflammation and stuff like that. So yeah, that's essentially how terpenes work. They're, if you know how essential oils work, they're pretty much the essential oils of each cannabis plant, you know, and people want to focus on THC and like THC is great and all, but if you really want to be hugged and cared for by this plant, you gotta, gotta search for your terps, you know? Okay. Okay. So the, the indica strain, I guess she said it's, it's more relaxing. Yes. Yeah. And a, a good way to remember it, indica in the couch. <laughs> yeah, so indicas will always uh, provide a more body high, um, sedating kind of high. Okay. And I, I noticed that uh, you got something on your shirt. It says sativa at the top. Yeah, it says sativa in the streets, indica in the sheets. <laughs> so, you know, kind of <laughs> provides mnemonic devices for my patients to see like, oh, in the streets, obviously awake, in the sheets, asleep. You know what I mean? Those are yeah. the little helpful tidbits. Yeah, and it makes me laugh. <laughs> but uh, you yeah, not help your shirt will. <laughs> exactly, and yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, sativas will always be um, the more energetic, uh, focus stimulating uh, types of strains. Okay, now, what's the what's the process like for determining? Uh, indica versus a sativa is that something that you can see visually or is that something that has to be done in the lab yeah so that is something that has to be uh, done in the lab but, but you can also see it physically as well so most sativa uh, plants have very long skinny sharp leaves on them like the cannabis like leaf that everybody knows if it's a sativa, the leaves will be long and skinny. If it's an indica, they'll kind of be short and shrubby and like fat. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So yeah, that you can see that physically, but also um, testing it like for its terpene um, profile, that's what's going to dictate what a strain is because we can get flour or any kind of product in the dispensary and it can say rest or it can say relax or enhance or like focus and stuff like that. But say you get a product that says rest and it's supposed to be an indica. If you switch it around and that term profile suggests that it has high levels of osamine, limonene, and pinene or terpenaline, that's going to have more of a, of a sativa effect, you know? So that's what you have to look for. Gotcha. Now, what about the, uh, the hybrid plants? So the hybrid plants are cool. Eventually, like... Indica, sativas, they're going to be a thing of the past one day. Everything is already being hybridized. Like all plants are being hybridized either here. Like one day you're going to see nothing but crosses of strains. Like parent strains are eventually going to fall off because you can only do cross genetics so many times. But uh, hybrids are essentially just, you know, two strains um, mated with each other, you know. Um, and you can either have an indica dominant hybrid or a sativa dominant hybrid. 
Okay. And what's the benefits of that? Why do you think the industry is going that way? I mean, I, I don't think it's more the industry. I think it's just overall nature, Chris. Okay. Because like cross genetics, like if you do it over and over and over and over again, that parent strain is kind of going to lose its abilities and like kind of necessarily die off. Okay. So will the, will that happen to the, the hybrids that were, I guess, created or bred as well? So we'll yeah. always have like an evolving plant or. I, I think so, man. I think that like hybrids are just going to keep becoming more hybridized and that's just what you're going to see. But you know, it, it means nothing about like degradation or anything like that. It, the cannabis is just keeps improving as the years go on, as we learn more about it. Okay. So you're yeah. going to be seeing more and more fire cannabis <laughs> as the years right. go on. So that, oh, I, there's a two really good things I want to ask about is like, I guess, you know, if you're in a state where it's not legal, you have to get it off the black market, you know? Um, and that could be, that could be dangerous. Um, one, because you gotta, you might have to deal with someone who's kind of sketchy and has to deal with doing things on the black market too, because of the police. Mm -hmm. um, and then three, because you don't know what the product you're getting. Exactly. Uh, and a lot of hearing how you describe uh, these, these plants compared to how you have to get it on the black market is completely different. You know, uh, I guess some, I can't say that I know this. I can't confirm that I know this, but <laughs> a lot of times uh, people who are getting a cannabis from the black market have someone tell them, Oh, it's this. And it's this, and you're like, is this an indica or a sativa? It's like, this is the name. You can look up the name. How do you, you can't, can you really confirm that by looking at it or by smelling it? Or you don't know what the grower's putting on it when they're growing it? Um, yeah, there's, yeah there's, those are the risks you take with the, with the black market. You know, and uh, it, it is a very different experience because, yeah, somebody can be like, oh, this is uh, some granddaddy purple just because it has like a little bit of purple in there or something like that. But, you know, all in all, it's just like it's it's used cars, it's used car salesman shit. You know, it's just yeah. like it's, it's a product that sells itself. So a little like suggesting, you know, they can just they'll buy it immediately. You know what I mean? And it's dangerous, you know, like. Um, I understand like people just like need to uh, work and make ends meet, you know, Bl black market dealers or whatever, you know, like I'm not discriminating them at all, but it, I wouldn't suggest that like a lot of people buy them, especially the vape cartridges, because you remember that whole thing when like vapes were, okay. So yeah, that's still a very real thing in the black markets. Like people are smoking these black market vapes and that they have high amounts of vitamin E acetate in them. And that can like create cyanide in the human lung, you know? So a lot of people get really sick and sometimes even die from right. these parts, you know? And that's, you know, that, and like I said, yeah, that's the, it's the black market, you know, not, they're not really in it because they care, you know? Yeah. Having said that, I know people just need to make a dollar at the end of the day. <laughs> right. Yeah, of course. You know, they, it's a, a demand and they try to, you know, solve that problem in the market. Uh, fortunately, you know, we've got some uh, legalization going and hopefully, you know, it spreads to other states where the prohibition is still going on. Yeah, I hope so. We, um, I think uh, PA is really looking at, um, at REC right now. And uh, we're going to have to wait till this November to see what happens. But yeah, hopefully um, this November we might get recreational. But let's just keep our heads up high. And so it's going to be on the ballot or is it something that the um, PA Senate is going to have to decide? I, th it's, I think it's ultimately going to have to be decided by the PA Senate and mm -hmm. stuff. But, um, you know, a lot of things usually happen in November. They usually when you go vote, there's usually a, a cannabis question in there about how you feel about legalization and yeah. stuff. And, um, yeah, I think there – I've heard that there is a, a rec bill floating around uh, for, for the next coming year. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. It should be exciting. Hopefully, you know, they can figure it out. Yeah. I, I, I hope they do. Everybody deserves relief from cannabis, you know? Yeah. So back to, you were mentioning that, uh, with the hybrids, we're going to get more fire weed. 
how are your older patients dealing with uh, the strengths of the new strains? Um, a, a lot of them are honestly d doing fine. You know, I can't specify on like the names of my patients, but uh, yeah, a lot of them, they, they do perfectly well. Sometimes they're asking for higher numbers <laughs> and stuff and it's, it's great, you know? And, and like, when I can fulfill that need for them, it's, it's amazing, you know, cause you know, the industry is great with like, you know, we're, we're taking care of pretty well, like financially, but that's the real paycheck is the older patients coming back and being like, my quality of life is extremely improved. And that's, that's where the real win exists in that, in that industry. But yeah, the older patients are, they're like, they're taking it fine. And so the other ones that are kind of naive to it, we'll just find them, one-to-one -one strains that's equal parts thc and cbd and stuff so nothing like too too jarring but yeah they usually they're, they're champs you know they handle it just fine okay that's great so uh speaking of cbd how how is that uh i guess not prescribed but given to your patients versus a thc when uh, you have a patient coming in for a medical needs Okay. Uh, so yeah, we, um, so anything that we carry in our shop as well as any other dispensary in PA, it's always going to, it's never going to be a hundred percent CBD. Uh, you're always going to have a little bit of THC in each one, but that's the beauty of CBD. The beauty of those two cannabinoids is that CBD and THC need each other more CBD needs THC, but, um, if you just have a tiny bit of THC in your CBD product, that CBD is going to work to its fullest extent. That's why a lot of like people who are getting completely ripped off by these gas stations and smoke shops who are just like, Oh, here's these CBD gummies that were definitely made from a scientist <laughs> or something yeah. like that. You know, um, they're, they're like, I don't feel anything. It's like, well, yeah, you're not obviously not supposed to feel anything psychoactivity wise, but you're also not going to feel the full relief that you can be feeling without just a little bit of THC. And that THC doesn't even have to be enough to get you high, just yeah. enough to help the CBD along. Okay. That, that was something I, I'd never heard before. It's something that a lot of people don't know that I, that really, they, they need to know, you know, I hate seeing people getting ripped off wanting relief, you know? Right. But yeah, and uh, we'll we'll have products that are um, like say for a patient who just wants CBD and no THC, we would give them you know like uh, a product that is a much higher ratio of CBD than THC. Send say like a ten to one CBD to THC, and that's going to be like little to absolutely no psychoactivity at all, all while receiving a full punch of CBD and getting all those natural benefits. Gotcha. Okay, so let's say. Um you know, I feel like I, I need to use cannabis and I'm a, a PA resident. Um, one, do I have to be a PA resident? How would I, and if I am, how do I go about uh, getting access to cannabis? So um, yeah, you do absolutely have to be a PA resident. Um, they're very strict on those laws um, as well as every state, you know, every state that has medical uh, cannabis, you would need a card for that state or you would need to be a resident of that state okay. um, so and covid has made the approval um thing a little bit hard uh usually at our dispensary you would just come in uh when the doctor was there usually on like a thursday and he would just go right upstairs um and tell them you know like why you want to be prescribed cannabis and then they they take it from there um right now there is a, a telemedicine uh hotline um, that I'm more than welcome to share with you later on. Um, but, uh, yeah, you just kind of call and schedule an appointment and talk to your doctor about, you know, like if cannabis has helped you in the past and if you want to pursue it more. Okay. Yeah. We'll put that number in the, uh, the description of yeah. the video if, uh, legally, if we can. For sure. I don't know what the marketing rules are for, uh, <laughs> medical cannabis if you don't if you do know what you mind telling us about like can you guys put out ads and that sort of thing so it, it's honestly chris it's it's forever changing it is the whole industry is a forever changing environment and that comes with like a lot of laws and restrictions and stuff like that as well as marketing like i know certain people are allowed to market but most of the time it's best to just like do your job and like promote if you can verbally but 
it since it's so ever changing, I never know if I can like put something out on the internet or anything like that, you know. Yeah, okay. So so once you get approved from your card is from your I guess from your doctor or the telemedicine hotline, what's the next step after that? Are you good to go? So yeah, you just pay your uh your card fee, which you know, a bunch of uh places like do it for their own price. A normal price is like $175. Um, and then you would pay a $50 fee to the state. And then I believe you would renew your medical cannabis card every year for well, 150 bucks. Okay. Um, and yeah, and you do it uh, yearly, but yeah. And then, uh, but after you get approved, you uh, would probably get your card one to two weeks later. Okay. And so then you get, you get that card. And, the, or... and when you, when you get that card and the activation date is like, a date that you know you were living that day, uh, mm -hmm. you are able to go anywhere in the state and receive your medical cannabis. Okay, so the initial fee that goes to the dispensary. I, but I, that goes to the doctor. I'm pretty sure that's the doctor's fee. Okay, and then the next fee goes to the state. Goes to the state. Yes. And then you get your card, and then you can go visit any dispensary. You got it, brother. Great. Okay, that seems pretty simple and straightforward. Yeah, it's a pretty easy process. Like I said, COVID has made it a little weird, but you know, if like you're unable to show up to the doctor, you could probably just do it over the phone, you know? <laughs> right. So if I come into the dispensary, are you guys still open right now during? Oh yeah, we've, we've, we've never stopped. No, no dispensary was able to stop, nor really did we want to. I mean, of course we're kind of scared of everything, mm -hmm. but um, we're technically a pharmacy and you know, in Italy, uh, was hitting the fan even their pharmacies were open so that had to be the same thing over here so yeah we, we haven't stopped <laughs> okay have you noticed any uh, are your patients getting hit hard or you notice and are they trying to do any studies on like people impacted by COVID and using cannabis yeah absolutely they um, I mean when it first started off you know there, there's always a great panic uh, before things like this. So a lot of like patients would come in and just try and load up as much as they can. They think they're going to be stuck in a cabin in the mountains until like years later when this is all over. Well, how much, so, how much can you buy it at one visit? It always, like I said, it always changes. Um, so at ours, we uh, usually put a 14 gram limit, but that's daily, you know, that's, and that's a pretty sweet gig because even over in Colorado, um, you can only get an ounce a month, which is a little ridiculous. Uh, but hey, states want to do what they want to do. Colorado's an amazing. Also, might be using the metric system. Well, that is the metric. I'm sorry for the <laughs> But uh, how much is uh, how many ounces or grams are an ounce? Rather, uh, there are 28. 28. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, it would be a little like um, counterproductive to buy like 28 single grams <laughs> out of this venture. Right. But but yeah, you can get a half ounce every single day here opposed to only getting an ounce every month over there, you know? So a lot of people are like kind of bummed out about it at first, but I'm like, dude, like come back tomorrow. <laughs> you know? For <before> PA. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, that's the, pretty much, that's the only limit, man. Like uh, as far as anything else, um, we really don't do any limits, you know, you can buy as many carts as you want buy as much concentrate as you want, many tinctures, you know, it's your world. The only thing we do limit is flour, and that's only just to make it available for everybody. You know what I mean? Give everybody a chance at getting it, you know, because there's certain strains that people wait for a long time to come back. And then when they come back, they'll be like, oh, somebody came in here, bought all of them. But that's not the case with us because we, we want to make sure everybody gets a chance. Okay. You got to be a little egalitarian. Yeah, so, yeah, right. Can't be gluttonous with all that fire flower. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's your what's your average day like at work? Um, so I just uh, I just clock in, see all my lovely coworkers, and kind of just grab a coffee, and then um, we start um, putting things uh, out for sale, and then um, then yeah, we just have a morning meeting, um, kind of like some last little like encouragement for the day because it gets pretty busy mm -hmm. and um and yeah and then we just uh throw on some music and uh open up the registers and let them let the horde come on in <laughs> so how do you go about uh suggesting the right strain for a patient so if i'm coming in and i'm like yo man 
You know, I've just been bummed out. All these protests going on. I had to already have like a medical ailment, right? So yeah, maybe I got a tennis elbow or well, first, what are what can I get a uh, prescribed cannabis for before we get uh, into well, anxiety is a huge one, which is why like a lot of people have been getting their cards right now. But you know, like uh, you can get cancer, um, AIDS. Um, you know, I'm pretty sure uh, cystic fibrosia is on there. Uh, MS, Parkinson's, cataracts, stuff like that. And uh, but anxiety is the main one because I tell people they're like oh i don't want to like lie to get a card and i'm like you're gonna tell me you've never never gotten nervous and never been anxious before like you know the planet you're living on right now you know it's it's anxiety within itself and you know like every human being anxious is a part of being alive and you know like that's what a lot of people realize that we are we all have anxiety yeah we all need a little help sometimes but yeah anxiety is the main one that people get the card for so Let's say you tell me I can get it for anxiety, but doesn't cannabis cause paranoia or that's a wives' tale? So no, uh, there are definitely certain strains that can, but it's all how it operates with your endocannabinoid system, which is a vast, like crazy system inside of us that pretty much proves that we were meant to have cannabis because we literally have in like in our brains, we have re- cannabis receptors and stuff. It's meant to be in our bodies. Okay. And um, so, yeah, there are certain strains that can give you paranoia based off of your own comfortability and your endocannabinoid system. Mine, since I, ha- I suffer from really bad uh, ADD, and so my mind is conf- constantly like hyper-focused and thinking about a million things at once. So indicas really work for me. So um, that kind of allows the brain to slow down and think about things one at a time opposed to all at once. Um, so if I were to smoke a sativa that is really, really fast paced, really like, uh, energetic, it kind of gives me anxiety, a little bit paranoid about silly things and Mm -hmm. stuff like that. But, uh, yeah, I, there, there's such a stank on the whole, um, maybe you're not smoking the right strain phrase, but it is a very real thing. And yeah, maybe cannabis isn't for everybody, but there are is a trial and error period that can be very um, frustrating because you got to find out what doesn't work for you and what does work for you, you know? Um, but once you do, it's an amazing process where you figure out which terpenes are going to alleviate that anxiety. So like I said, remember the linalool terpene we talked about? If you have a strain that's high in that, you'll have a pretty good chance of dodging that paranoia and that anxiety. Okay. So what's it, what's it like when you get a, a new shipment? that you guys have never had how is there like a clamoring (laughs) in the in the dispensary are you allowed to try it and and then how do you go about uh determining which patients should get it oh well you honestly uh when when we get a new batch we've never had before i mean it happens all the time you know it's it's ever changing and like i said everything's being hybridized new strains are coming out all the time um but no i mean yeah when patients see that there's a new strain on that uh on our website they it boom boom sells right out really quick um but the way we determine if it's going to help for certain patients just looking on the back doing a little research ourselves and looking at the terpene profiles and seeing like what this experience is going to generate you know okay that's really cool it's, it's completely different from you know anything that you know i've experienced and you know um just i couldn't imagine just seeing somebody cart in like pounds <laughs> pounds of cannabis <laughs> into my vicinity that would be so weird yeah it is uh um, exciting <laughs> it, it's, it's not what you think like in terms of like us just like them delivering like a whole bag of nuggets you know it's just like you know, in, in the medical industry, everything's prepackaged. You can't really see the flower. It's, uh, it's all in just, like, containers and stuff. Um, okay. so each grower processor puts their logo on. But um, that's the only, like, kind of annoying part about it is that, like, um, you have to try them all first to give an honest recommendation. You know, because mm-hmm. if a patient's like, hey, have you tried this? If I haven't, I'm going to be straight up be like, no, I haven't tried this. But the terpene profile suggests that it's going to make you feel like this. You know, like, I'll never bullshit a patient, you know, but I will, like, that's why it's good to try everything. So you can be like, oh, yeah, this does that. This does that. But even 
having said that, all that, like I said, our endocannabinoid systems are so vast and so different and affected so differently that like, you know, it's all, it's all trial and error. You know, you have to see how it works for you. Right. Now is, is there, are, are there growers in PA? Uh, oh yeah. So there is in the medical industry in Pennsylvania, you cannot receive flour from anywhere that isn't growing out of, uh, out of PA. So everything sold in that state must be cultivated in that state too. And yeah, right now I would say we have about nine, about nine or 10 growers that we receive from um, throughout the months. Okay. It was just a lot different because when I first started in September of last year, um, it was, uh, it was a lot because we had four growers so there was a flower drought in pennsylvania like you would go to some dispensaries and they'd be like we don't have any flower wow and you would have to get a cartridge or concentrate or an edible or a tincture or something like that you know but now um and it was because anxiety got put to the list so more people were you know obviously able to get cannabis and we didn't have enough growers to supply everybody um, but yeah, now they're coming in hot and flour is usually always available at every dispensary. Okay. Got it. So you said you started last September. Yeah. Okay. You coming up on your can anniversary. Dude, that's <laughs> so funny that you said that because right when I started the shop was turning one and they called it the can anniversary. Okay. That's, that, dude, I had gotta... to get that one out, man. <laughs> it was fire, dude. That was <laughs> That was a good singer right there, man. Yeah. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> yeah, I, I really like your energy, man. And I love how like patient focused you are. Uh, that just really, uh, you know, makes me feel good, man, to know that there's people like you out there helping the folks who need it and now have access to, to this medicine. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. The patients are why I got into this industry. You know, I, I want everybody on this earth to be able to be healed by cannabis and not looked at as a criminal, you know what I'm saying? Like, and you know, we, it's been a long time coming for us all to be like, you know, and especially like people of color, you know, are just completely like treated as criminals for wanting to have this plant. And it's, you know, it's, we're winning slowly, but surely it's coming to an end. You know, we, we are going to win in the end. Good. Yeah. I, uh, I, I agree, man. So, I'm sure everybody wants to know what is the compensation like for someone who is a bud tender? Uh, if you don't mind talking about that a little bit, if you, you don't have to give us exacts, but you can give us a range if you want. Yeah. I mean, it, uh, it varies, you know, through like any dispensary, they can start you out from anywhere from like 15 to 20, you know, right. But like I said, it's it's completely up to the dispensary and whatever they decide, they decide for you. <laughs> yeah, do that. And, there, and there is room for growth in most dispensaries, I would say. Okay. I, yeah, I feel like there's a there's a lot of uh, verticals in the industry. So I'm guessing you, once you get in, you can decide the path you want to go. It, exactly, you get it. Okay. So do are these positions salaried or do they come with uh, any benefits? Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Benefits are included. Um, we, uh, we have health insurance and stuff like that. Um, so the only jobs that are very, uh, salaried, uh, in the dispensary, I would say, at least from my experience are the pharmacists. Okay. Like Cause every dispensary is required to have a pharmacist. If like a patient wanted to come in for a consultation, they could talk like directly to a pharmacist before they talk to us patient counselors. Um, but, uh, yeah, the, the pharmacists mainly are, are salaried. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Oh, one thing I wanted to ask you before I forget is does being a patient who receives a cannabis or you having a cannabis card, does that prohibit you from working in, in any industries or prevent you from doing anything in the state? No, I see that it's such a weird gray area with that question because, um, most people kind of just like don't mention it um, until it were to come up. You know, if you were to have a job or to be in a certain industry that kind of looks down on cannabis, if they were to bring that out and be like, okay, well, I have a medical 
cannabis card right here. This is my medicine that I need to perform my daily duties and stuff like that. But you, it's it's always up to the employer, you know, because right now the cannabis is still federally illegal, which is insane because they just deemed it an essential service during the middle of a global pandemic. And now they're going to go right back to demonizing it. So don't forget that that happened. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's always, it's always up to the employer and how they, how they feel about that. Gotcha. So is there anything that you would want people to know before they decided to go ahead and apply for that cannabis card? Oh, yes. Um, Another very important thing is, and I hope this all changes because in my opinion, it's just another way to demonize cannabis. But if you were to get your medical cannabis card, you do waive your right to own, um, not to own, but have a concealed carry weapon. Like I said, you can still own um, a, like a gun, but it has to be in your house, in a safe. You know, you're not going to be able to walk around with that or anything like that. So, yeah, if I'd say if that's a real thing that you're attached to, um, then, yeah, don't, don't get your card if that's going to be a, a problem, you know. Okay. So can you, can you legally transport your weapon if you were still a gun owner? Or, like, it can't be on your person, it can't be on your car, it can only be in your house. Exactly. It can only be in your house. Okay. Wow. So, yeah, you're, you're waiving your, your First Amendment to gain access to cannabis. Mm-hmm. And I, I can't agree with that at all. No, dude, I've, I'm right there with you. And, like, a, a lot of us are. You know, I would say more of us are than not. And, yeah. you know, because not to demonize anybody who does, because this can really help somebody and, like, when they need it, but you know, anybody can have an Oxycontin prescription or like, uh, you know, a Percocet prescription and go out and buy a gun, you know? And like a lot of those, like people just to st- uh, statistically speaking, you know, somebody who were to have a problem with those is more inclined to, you know, maybe use a weapon uh, to get more of those drugs compared to somebody who, you know, just uses cannabis. More than the time, they're going to be like, I don't want a gun anyway. But if they do, you know, like, they're not going to go rob for more and stuff like that. And like I said, I'm not saying that everybody that is on those drugs does that, but it's just like, you know, you can, okay, you can go out and you can buy a fifth of vodka and, like, go shoot your gun off and, you know, maybe even, like, hurt somebody with that. But if you're experimenting with cannabis, you can't. It just doesn't make any sense. Right. Well, hopefully that's an, another thing that will be in the future that will change. I, I hope so, because legal consulting adults um, shouldn't have to worry about going somewhere and protecting themselves. Right. Everybody should have that right. Cool, man. So, like, before we go, like, what what do you like to do for fun, man, you know, when you're not at work? Um, so when I'm not at work, uh, I usually like the skateboard. Um, I hike all the time. I'm constantly like chasing mountains, chasing waterfalls and stuff. Kind of just, um, so I can get up like on a mountain and kind of just like reevaluate my position in the world. Know that like all my worries are kind of just, just worries at the end of the day. And, yeah. Um, so yeah, I really like to hike. That's like my main thing. Um, and, uh, I write, I write poetry and um basically just like honestly trying to spread more awareness about about the movement and everything you know and um yeah that's pretty much about it that and just hang out with friends cool man so if any medical patients want to connect with you um do you have an instagram uh i do um it's uh rolling uh underscore st0 m3r all right cool we'll make sure we get it in the description as well and uh, since we're at the end of this, you know, I can kind of cut this out if I need to, but you mind telling us where you work at? Uh, I work at uh, Herbology in uh, Philadelphia. Okay. Is Herbology, did they start in PA or did uh, uh, come so from somewhere else? They started in Chicago. And um, we, are, we are currently being um, merged with another dispensary called Cureleaf. Um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, Herbology started out in uh, Philadelphia or Chicago, and they are grassroots parent companies. And grassroots is like one of the best, one of the best growers in the entire state. Um, but uh, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much what we are. 
Cool, man. All right. Well, thanks a lot for your time, Kevin. I have to say your background has been tripping me out this entire time. <laughs> Waiting in the background. <laughs> oh, yeah. I figured I was like, yes, that'll, that'll be fun to look at. <laughs> but thank you. Yeah, cool. So make sure you guys check out Kevin. Maybe he has some poetry on his Instagram. And uh, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate you having me today. All right, Kevin. Peace, man. Peace out, brother.